Today is Tuesday, the 22nd of August 2017. Uh, this is Block Digest and it is block height 481,639. And today we're joined by a special guest, Eric Lombroso, Bitcoin Core developer. Say hi. Hey, how's it going, guys? And uh, we've also got Shinobi Monkey. Hello, world. Hey. And we're joined by Blake Anderson. Thanks for having me. That was cool. The bit bonker animation. We must have had it suspended for so long that there was just nothing that came through. It well, like. actually, the the blocks have been empty. I don't know what, what everyone all the fuss is about about needing big blocks. They've been empty for quite a while. We're also joined by Atnix. You're outside today. Yeah, I'm outside. It's a little hot out, so yeah. Figured I'd uh, head to the woods. No, fantastic. We're bringing us closer to nature. And our inline producer is, of course, uh, Mr. Hoddle. Hey, how you doing, guys? Hey, and we've also got Shanine as well in the background. And so let's go straight off to the news today. Um, and we want to reflect on something that we covered in yesterday's show, which was the, the chain analysis software um, that is commonly used. In fact, uh, there is actually a company called Chain Analysis, and this is the one that's uh, used in this article entitled, The IRS has been using Bitcoin tracking software since 2015. It's by Stan Higgins. It's almost as if Stan was watching our show yesterday and going through all of this. And Shinobi, I, th I remember you saying you, you had some thoughts on it. We did talk about the technical details yesterday, but just tell us what you think. I mean, I think to really like pull the most that you can out of this article, there is a, a bit of good news and, and a bit of bad news. And obviously, uh, bad news first. I, I, this pretty much confirms that an, a government agency in the United States is attempting to, on a massive level, build a graph connecting outputs on the Bitcoin blockchain to actual people's identities on a large scale. And I, I think that's something that a lot of people in this community have assumed for a long time. But I, I think this is, uh, we can take this as the final confirmation that this is actually going on. But the piece of good news, I think, is, is this is indicative of a lot of exchanges likely keeping the personal information they have about their customers a lot closer to the chest than we might have thought. If, if we look at the, the fact that the IRS has been using chain analytics for the past two years and kind of line that up side by side with the uh, requests for customer information from Coinbase at such a large scale, I think that shows that they're making a lot of strides on the technical side of analyzing the chain. But when it really comes to tying that to people, you need taint on the coins you need some point at which it is definitively tied to a person's identity to really go from that point and then follow their habits across the rest of their uh, transactions on the chain and the fact that they are in such a huge uh, legal movement with coinbase that is i'd say quite honorably putting up a good fight about it to get such a large uh, database of consumer information that they don't really have a lot of that information tying things to people's personal identity. So I think like that this very much shows that it is more important than ever to start working in privacy features into Bitcoin in, in whatever way possible, whether it's Lightning Network or other second tier layers that add obscurity, things like a zero link, like we were discussing yesterday with a Samurai Wallet and a Nopara from Hidden Wallet just any tool that we have in our bag that can improve that in any level, we need to start deploying those and actually educating people on their importance and how to use them. Well, it reminds me of some of the decisions that were made in terms of programming pro tip. They wanted to try to avoid having this big honeypot of data with that clear taint of people's, you know, actively being used social media profile tied to a, a, a string of addresses and stuff like that. So I think that um, that what you're saying is correct, and that certain certain things can be done, and hopefully to uh, to, to mitigate some of these these risks of uh, fungibility attacks. Yeah, that's right. So what we were saying yesterday, and you can go back into yesterday's show. Um, was that oftentimes when you use a computer to use any of this new digital technology, you only have front side anonymity, front end anonymity. That means that you're only anonymous to the world. You're not anonymous to the company that you're interacting with. And mergers and acquisitions are a very common thing. And if that company merges with another company in the space and you registered with the same email address, then they can tie that together and then you're exposed. You don't have a forward secrecy in that way. Was there anything else we wanted to say about that topic? Or have we 
I, th I think that, that's pretty much the, the important bits, the, the little ray of hope and then the downside it's trying to eliminate. Yeah. Okay, so our second story, moving along very swiftly, and now we're getting to the crux of today's show, is uh, Bit Waller is basically saying, I don't know, are they, are they pulling out of the Segwit2x agreement or are they basically just saying we're friends with Core? Because I'll, I'll get to the chase because there's kind of a long post here, but really it all summed up at, at the bottom, uh, quoting, we will not actively fork away from what we view as Bitcoin, in quotes, which is the chain that is supported by the current Core dev team. We urge all developers to take into account the demands of users and all parties of the NYA and address them adequately, if not implement them. I'm sure we've got a lot to say about this. Uh, who wants to go first? I mean, do you, have, do you have something to offer, Eric, as uh, one of these developers yourself? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm encouraged to see that uh, some people are stepping up and, uh, you know, are, are actually looking at that there's some severe problems to the to the NYA and uh, a lot of issues that were not addressed and are not being uh, uh, solved by it. Um, it did mention one thing, though, that I think was a little bit in inaccurate was that, uh, you know, uh, I think that the statement mentioned something. I read it yesterday. I just saw it on the screen right now, but I didn't catch it there. But um, about it being uh, about um, core developers uh, never supporting a, a bigger blocks or so. Or, yeah, it says, uh, it says um, instead, you could argue that most Bitcoin core developers are actively opposed to larger blocks of any size. And I just wanted to say that that's actually uh, not true. Um, the, the, the main issue that we the, the most core developers have really had with this is the fact that there's a contentious issue here that creates an incompatibility on the network. And um, I personally did not take sides on whether big, you know, whether blocks should be two megabytes or one megabyte or whatever. That's not really the issue for me. I mean, I, I, I definitely think that bigger blocks are going to make validation costs more expensive and it does um, have impact on, on, on the decentralization. Um, but, you know, my main issue, at least, you know, I don't speak for everyone in, in this, but I think that I think, I think a lot of uh, other um, core contributors would tend to agree with this and a lot of uh, you know Bitcoin core supporters is that um, the, the, the main issue here is the fact that people are trying to change the rules uh, without the consent of users. Um, and, and then that's really the, the, the crux of the, the problem here. Um, I think if uh, these companies had actually approached us and tried to find a way forward uh, and we could actually find a way to get people to agree to something and our advice had been listened to and, uh, you know, we hadn't been kind of like ignored and like shrugged off to the side, um, things would be very different. I, you know, I think that right now it's just that the fact that um, I, I feel like um, a, a lot of a lot of good advice has just been completely neglected and ignored and, and these companies decided to kind of push forward with something uh, with without our consent, without the consent of users, you know, that's, that's basically the, the, the key issue here. I mean, it's not really about us. It's really about all the users in the community, uh, all the stakeholders. Um, and uh, my interest is in protecting all those stakeholders and, and making sure that, uh, uh, you know, it's not possible for, for people to just arbitrarily change the rules from under them uh, without their consent. So I just wanted to clarify that one point. Yeah, th thank you very much for that clarification. And as we speak, I understand that Satoshi's vision is being realized. And that uh, the longest chain is now the, the Bitcoin Cash I, chain. Is there? You already said Satoshi's vision. I just want to I want to jump in and say Drink. I just love I, I love to hear a, a responsible approach to change management and to not hear Satoshi's vision said. But then you you ruined it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not averse a little bit of sarcasm every now and again. But I can finally buy big uh, coffee with my Bitcoin. Now, I'm, so just, right? I'm just I'm just I'm just trying to figure this out. Um, so that 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 is something that's happening as we speak. Uh, that there are now more uh, blocks mined on on the Bitcoin Cash chain. And uh, but that's largely because they just lowered the difficulty. So I think they're kind of cheating there. So but Eric, see, I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry to jump in here, but I, I think yeah. that really kind of demonstrates the error in one of their core assertions. Are any of the exchanges flipping the tickers over now? Is is everybody now just that's Bitcoin? Did that instantly change people's mind or how they perceive things or interact with each other? No. It, well, it has to be valid under the rules that people choose to enforce. And the longest chain, it doesn't matter a bit to me unless it fits within the rules I'm enforcing. I agree with everything you just said there, except um, what segwit 2 x Camp is trying to do is create a hard fork with no replay protection. And that changes everything. So they're not B Bitcoin Cash. You know, They basically flat out told us that they are an altcoin. They are willing to compete. This isn't what Segwit to X Camp is trying to do. It seems like what they're trying to do is to say that replay protection should be your responsibility when in practice it's not 
effective to go through and to dial back a lot of infrastructure that's already in place. It would make more sense in terms of pure practicality to be able to roll it out in a way where it can be that way from the start going forward. Well, but, uh, I'd really like to hear what Eric has to say about this. Um, from what I understand, just because they have majority hash rate doesn't mean they are not prone to replay attacks. I mean, it's still going to be a problem no matter what. Um, so I don't know what the end game is there, but it, it really nothing really makes sense on that on their side. Well, I, I got a couple of comments regarding that. Um, as far as like you know, uh, hash rate, really, um, hash rate is not an indicator an indicator of any kind of security unless it's really distributed across many different uh, entities that have uh, very different interests. Uh, if it's just a few players that are controlling the majority of the hash rate. Um, it actually doesn't provide any additional security over existing like bank infrastructure or other systems that are centralized like that. Um, so um, uh, hash rate really doesn't mean anything unless it's really you know highly distributed across many different jurisdictions and many different people around the world. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, um, the you know the difficulty was much much lower uh, for for the BCH chain. And there's there's an arbitrage opportunity. Um, miners are taking advantage of this, and I mean I can't fault them for this. It's just something that's a loophole that existed there, and I think that you know they realize, wait, hey, if I mine on the BCH chain and sell for Bitcoin, I can actually make more money, right? I can get more, I can accumulate more BT, more BTC. But everyone, you know, I think most of the miners are, are playing a game of trying to accumulate as much BTC as they can, and this is just an oppor another opportunity to do that. Right, so I mean, I can't really fault them for doing that. That's what's in their own interest. Um, uh, but uh, you know, it, it, it has to be understood that, it, that this does not reflect any sort of, um, you know, uh, this does not reflect any sort of. It's not representative of the users or or people who actually are, you know, the rest of the stakeholders in the in the community or, or people that actually, uh, you know, hold coins. So um, I I definitely uh, think that uh, it's it's necessary to understand not only how much hash rate some chain has, but uh, what the incentives are there. Who who has that hash rate? Uh, you know, uh, and and uh, what that actually entails for you know whether or not it. it uh, accurately represents the interest, or if it actually serves the interest of the users. Yeah, good points. And I know, Eric, you want to focus on some of the positive things, because of course, uh, Bitcoin has SegWit uh, being activated very soon. Um, but I did just want to cover something that I did see on, on that place that we dare not mention, RBTC. And I'm not a big fan of Reddit, but I do have to be inclusive on this channel. We, we were a very young channel. We only started a, just over a week old now. Um, and so I wanted to editorially make the decision to make sure that I'm inclusive. And the reason is, is that, you know, a model that doesn't include is a broken model. And so somebody said that, uh, picked up on your post on the uh, Bitcoin mailing list saying that uh, Bitcoin core developer Eric Tombroso claims that decisive action, both technical and legal, has been prepared for Segwit2x. Could you elaborate on that, on what you meant by technical and legal? I mean, I know you did a follow up post to this, but if you could say in your own words. Well, I mean, in hindsight, I kind of uh, regret having made that post. I realize that um, there's a lot of fudsters out there and people who are just trying to make noise. Um, I, I don't think that these these people are particularly, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the ones that are that are going to be uh, calling the shots on this. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, I, I think that there's definitely a, a campaign to kind of create a lot of noise around this. Um, I, 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 you know, it's, I, I just just to clarify, though, uh, I didn't say that it was a decisive action against Segwit 2x. Uh, it was a, a decisive action against people trying to destroy the legacy chain. Uh, which is a very different thing. I think people, if they want to sign their own agreements and create their own blockchains, um, I think they're free to do that. No, none of us, uh, are, you know, it's not. I don't think it's in our right to stop people from doing that if they want to, right? Um, but I think that what they don't have the right to do is to attack another chain and to try to destroy it. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, the fact that it's so easy to add replay protection to a hard fork and that uh, it hasn't been done uh, um, seems to suggest that there is an intent to, to, you know, if not destroy the legacy chain, at least create a lot of uh, confusion and, and and a mess there, and and a lot of people could potentially lose a lot of uh, a, a lot of money there, a lot of their assets, and um, I I'm very concerned that there could be a lot of collateral damage to any kind of thing that happens there. So um, I I think that uh, you know having replay protection would be absolutely a must. Um, I I don't think that. Um, you know, and, and obviously I'm going to be misquoted by by people that have other uh, agendas or whatever. So uh, uh, this is obviously a misquote. Uh, it's, it's taken out of context, and uh, I, I don't think I have much more to say on that. 
Yeah, great. Yeah, you did. You did actually put it in a follow up post uh, saying that you wanted a, a peaceful split and, and so on. I just wanted yeah. to make sure that you had a, a chance to respond mm -hmm. to, to that claim. And so do do tell us then about the, the upcoming Segway activation and the benefits that will bring. Yesterday we talked about Lightning Network and and how soon do you think a lot of these features that have been promised are going to come on board? Right. So. Uh... Ah, great. Um, tomorrow, SegWit is activating. Um, we're super, super excited about this. Uh, all of us that worked on it, it's been a, a very, very long uh, slog. Uh, it's been a marathon. I think a lot of us have uh, learned tremendous amounts of stuff uh, during this these last couple of years, but it's obviously been uh, also tremendously stressful at times. Um, SegWit is uh, basically like what I like. I, I kind of draw the analogy to like the World Wide Web of Bitcoin. Um, it will enable transactions to link to other transactions. It's kind of like hyperlinks on a web page, uh, so that you're able to uh, have this entire web of transactions off the chain, off the blockchain, so it doesn't actually impact, uh, it doesn't actually add load to the network. And, and it can be more uh, architected in, in a way similar to the way that the World Wide Web is, where people can set up their own web servers and uh, not have to host all the content themselves, right? Um, I, I think that it just makes a lot more sense. If we want to scale this up to billions of users, um, it doesn't make sense for everyone to have to run a full node that verifies every single or you know it, obviously not everyone's going to run a full node but you know i think that it should be an option for people to be able to do it if they want to um imagine if you had to run a server that hosted every single website on the planet uh, it, it would just be absolutely impossible right so you want to have a an, an architecture for the network where uh, uh people can organically just kind of uh, expand the network by creating their own sites and linking to other sites and so segwit by fixing the transaction malleability issue uh, allows this for, for Bitcoin. So, so we get something more akin to the World Wide Web and we're able to develop applications uh, where people can actually uh, have these smart contracts floating around and linking to each other and um, things don't have to actually be settled on the blockchain uh, uh, unless you're uh, opening or closing channels or unless there's a dispute. Uh, which drastically reduces uh, the, the amount of load that is required for the network. This is probably the lowest hanging fruit as far as scalability is, you know, don't don't force people to validate stuff that's not necessary for them to validate. If, if uh, you know, two parties transact and, uh, you know, they uh, are happy with the outcome of the transaction, why does anyone else need to validate that? It's not necessary, right? Um, so once we cut that out, uh, basically uh, we're reducing the, the cost of validation uh, significantly. And so now we can actually achieve much more exponential scaling uh, where uh, the the, the cost for the entire network actually grows, you know, uh, sublinearly, actually, uh, you know, perhaps even logarithmically to the to the number of users and the number of transactions on the network. Uh, and, and this will allow a lot of uh, other very, very interesting use cases that are simply not possible currently with uh, with Bitcoin, uh, or at least are, are not secure. For instance, uh, um, uh, instant micropayments. Um, right now, uh, if you want to do an instant micropayment on chain, uh, first of all, there's fees, which make it you know prohibitively expensive to you know deal in milli satoshi transactions and stuff like that, right? And um, also, you have the confirmation issue. Um, you know, so so I mean, obviously, you want to protect against double spends, but by having this kind of uh, you know uh, things like the Lightning Network. Uh, you're able to create uh, a whole infrastructure on top of Bitcoin that enables people to have uh, smart contracts that, that are able to, to enforce whatever their uh, conditions are, uh, even if the other parties disappear or renege on the agreement. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, if the Bitcoin blockchain is gold, this is the analogy I usually give. If the Bitcoin blockchain is gold, then things like the Lightning Network are like paper money, except that it cannot be counterfeit and uh, it can always be redeemed for gold. And, and you can be sure that you're going to get your gold for it. So uh, this obviously, I, I can, you know, obviously nobody's going to be carrying around, you know, uh, tons of gold with them everywhere. Right. So uh, paper money is obviously far more convenient for most uh, small transactions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's also the case for, for Bitcoin. So um, I'm really, really excited about all this stuff that's happening right now. I think there's a lot of great uh, teams out there uh, that, that are working on very, very interesting stuff. Um, uh, I think it's going to take a little while until we get you know, good infrastructure that is really able to support an application layer that, uh, you know, people can really build atop. Um, but I think it'll, it might happen quicker than we think. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that we tend to maybe uh, um, overestimate, you know, the short term and, and underestimate the slightly longer term. But in this case, I think that, uh, you know, within the next several months, we should probably start to see uh, practical applications. Um, and, and one more thing I wanted to say is that um, not only does it allow you to have this web of transactions on one blockchain, it actually allows you to set up smart contracts between different blockchains. So you could set up asset trades between blockchains and smart contracts uh, for conditions on these kinds of swaps and make direct swaps between blockchains, uh, which which has a whole bunch of new uh, you know liquidity 
interesting models and, and, and possibilities for being able to uh, have, you know, more decentralized exchanges and, and really, really cool stuff. So all this stuff is super, super exciting. Great. I just want to uh, ask a, a, a simple question, if we can back up for a moment. Is it a correct characterization to say that first we needed to uh, make the, the Bitcoin network more efficient before we could scale it? Is that really what's the issue here? Because when I heard a lot of the debate going on, I actually heard a lot of people agreeing with each other in essence, like in principle, but really disagreeing on the sequence and the order of events. Um, a lot of people didn't agree with having bigger blocks. They just disagreed with the timing. So is that a correct characterization? We're making the network more efficient so that we can scale it later on. Um, yeah, I'd say that I'd say that that's you know that, that there's um, that's pretty close to, to the truth. I think that um, it's it's you know just to make a dif uh, I think I'd, I'd like to distinguish between throughput and scale. Um, you know, throughput is just the the raw number of transactions that can be processed per minute or whatever, right? Um, scale also has economic implications and uh, implications in terms of the uh, computer science complexity theory. Um, in complexity theory and computer science, you're looking at uh, how how much time or how much uh, you know uh, com computational power, how, how much CPU, how much how many how much computational resource is required to be able to perform a certain computation given the size of the input, right? Um, if you double the size of the input, but it requires four times as much computation, then you have an algorithm that's not particularly efficient. And even though at small scale it might be faster than other algorithms. Once you get past a certain point, then it just starts to become slower and slower and slower. And at some point, it just like cannot handle it anymore, right? So um, we need algorithmic scaling where we actually have algorithms that can process more transactions uh, per, per unit of time uh, that do not require uh, much more computational resources. Uh, and, and, and so this requires more, uh, you know, a little more uh, um, sophistication in the way that the, uh, you know, the system is designed for efficiency. So yes, that's true that we want to make the system more efficient. But I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, double a certain particular parameter, like say the block size, um, that increases throughput, but that doesn't necessarily increase scale because it doesn't take all the economic consequences into effect. It doesn't take all the, you know, externalities, all, all the, um, you know, uh, so socialized costs and, and other issues into account. And in order to really grow a healthy ecosystem, all of these things need to be considered. Fantastic. Shinobi, you have something you want to Awesome. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to like half lead us into another direction, but kind of tie back to uh, some of what you were just talking about there. But um, when, when you were talking about atomic swaps uh, between blockchains, I kind of wanted to discuss a little bit about how that could be used to actually interact with a Bitcoin sidechain and, and not an entirely different network. Uh, like some of the things that I, I see when, when the topic of sidechains come up are, are mostly the one fear of, of a federated control over that with really the, the federated sidechain model being the only thing flushed out to any substantial degree. And then two, obviously the people are very scared about in the long term uh, miners income drying up if a lot of traffic were to move to these sidechains. But I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit uh, about the, the nature of a, a federated chain when you bring something like Lightning Network and, and atomic swaps into the picture. Because I, I think like the big fear is that if you were to move into an environment like that with some of your coins, then you're pretty much at the at the total mercy of uh, whoever's operating that chain. And uh, I, I was wondering, um, obviously Blockstream has confidential transactions built into their alpha elements uh, right now. Like what ways do you think we could like combine all of these tool sets that we have to kind of alleviate some of those concerns or offer people like modes of interacting with that type of environment where it's not so completely just handing complete control over to whoever's running that uh, federated chain? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I haven't really worked too much on, on uh, side chains myself, uh, but I have to say I consider side chains to really be a tool for experimentation uh, and to explore different uh, ideas, not so much for production and release of product. So that's my own personal view. I mean, I don't work for Blockstream. Um, I've, you know, I've never been employed by them, and I don't own any equity in them. I just want to make get that out of the way. So um, I mean, I, I do work with them, and I do think that uh, we do um, uh, have a lot of uh, productive interactions, uh, especially uh, with regards to contributions to open source development. Um, however, um, I, I think that as far as like uh, you know side chains, uh, what I've seen most come out of it, for instance, uh, the first implementation of SegWit was actually done by Peter uh, Wheeler on uh, on uh, the Elements sidechain. Um, and it was done on Testnet. It wasn't actually a commercial thing. 
so, uh, but but that kind of uh, helped prove out the concept. Um, I think uh, you know what got me more excited about it. I, I think as long, as long as it was on a side chain, I thought that it was an interesting experiment, but I didn't really see a practical way to deploy it at the moment. Uh, it wasn't until we discovered that it was possible to um, soft fork it in. Uh, and, and actually, uh, uh, not have to have uh, you know, and, and be able to do this in a smooth way to have a smooth transition into it. That actually got me really, really excited about SegWit uh, as something that was a practical thing. Um, so, as far as like the whole federated model, um, obviously for cryptographic purists, uh, there's a little bit of, I mean, you know, that it's a little bit uncomfortable in some sense. Um, I think it's a very different trust model than uh, uh, having just uh, you know a pure cryptographic proofs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it turns out that having these compact proofs to be able to, uh, you know, show uh, things uh, from, from, you know, across blockchains uh, turned out to be a lot more difficult than maybe was initially anticipated. So the federated model kind of uh, and is the only practical way to to uh, to do it right now. Um, I mean, I think that it, you know. It, it, there's definitely certain applications where the federated model might be the best way to go for certain things. I think that for like certain escrow applications uh, where you have certain oracles or certain kinds of conditions that might not be something that you can just, you know, objectively measure on the network. It's, it's something that people need to actually observe and or, or make some judgment on or something. There needs to be some kind of human decision, right? Um, having a multi-sig model with, you know, several different signers uh, uh, that, that are able to, um, to do this, uh, you know, might make sense for those kinds of uh, situations. Um, but I don't think that that should be forced on all users for all applications. I think that it's uh, important that we do have this more cryptographic pure uh, base layer uh, that allows us to, to not have to rely on these kinds of things and, and just make it kind of optional at the higher layers. To answer your question, Shinobi? Yeah, so, so pretty much just like, um, like take what we have in the level of uh, relative decentralization and trustlessness we have on the main layer, and then kind of expand out of that in the different trust models and kind of partition away like things that would be impossible to do on the main chain or uh, affect those uh, like core qualities detrimentally is what you're saying, right? Well, I think also, I mean, the, the idea behind sidechains is that, um, I mean, at least the way I understand it, I was not one of the original authors of the of the sidechains paper, uh, but I, I do uh, know all of those guys very well and have talked to them quite a bit about it. Um, the idea was to enable experimentation of new features without having to uh, create an altcoin uh, or, you know, basically you could still peg it to Bitcoin uh, and you could still have, um, you know, these uh, kind of opt-in features where people can say, oh, I want to try this out. And uh, they're taking a risk because obviously it's something that hasn't been fully deployed and tested and, you know, not, not a lot of people have used yet, you know, but you can be the test pilot if you want. And and I think that that's a good thing. I think if you if you want to be the one, the first one to jump in the water and and, and test it, uh, that that's great. And, and I think that, you know, if we have a way for people to be able to opt into new kinds of features uh, and, and see whether or not it actually makes sense before uh, kind of pulling everyone else in, uh, that's that's great. Um, however, um, as far as uh, infrastructure for deploying this kind of stuff, I still think that that needs a lot of extensive work. Um, whereas, for instance, stuff like Softworks already has a very extensive body of, of scientific research behind it um, and a lot of uh, empirical data from, from past Softworks that have been done. We're, we're very familiar with the process and uh, a lot of different approaches have been tried. And, and we, we know, uh, uh, you know that this, this, is a, uh, this is a viable way of actually upgrading the protocol and not getting a chain split, uh, you know, assuming that people actually agree on stuff, right? Uh, but um, I still think that uh, it's um, it, it's mostly for experimentation, and I don't know if side chains as something that's deployed uh, as kind of like the place where you know most of the commercial activity is happening necessarily makes sense. Uh, maybe some of the people uh, that, that worked on this stuff would disagree with me. Um, I, I defer to them to comment more on this. Uh, I, I don't consider myself to be uh, a super expert on, on, on side chains. I know I've, I've worked with uh, you know a lot of these people and I've seen a lot of really interesting ideas uh, developed on it, um, but I'm still a little bit skeptical about the actual deployability. Um, just w one last like follow up on that. Like, uh, w what exactly are do you mean in terms of like infrastructure? Do you mean like at the actual securing of of the keys that would be handling the chain, the delivering of the the blocks through a, a network structure, or what explicitly? 
Well, that, and then, you know, there's deployment of software. Obviously, if, uh, you know, people want to run these side chains and they want to be able to validate these different things, um, there needs to be a model for them to be able to deploy this. And there needs to be a whole uh, application stack. So people, so application developers can build atop this and, uh, you know, a whole set of libraries and APIs and easy w ways for, uh, you know, and, and uh, an application development framework or some kind of programming model uh, that allows new developers to come in and to be able to, to do some something with this, right? Um, right now, none of that really exists. Right now, people that are experimenting with side chains, for the most part, um, are pretty, uh, you know, big experts at the, you know, the lowest level of the protocol itself. I mean, they're they're they're, you know, they're Bitcoin protocol experts. Um, we can't expect all app developers to be Bitcoin protocol experts. Just like right now, most web developers don't work down at the TCP/IP level, right? So um, uh, we need this infrastructure, and we need this whole application stack uh, in order to actually make this practical. And I think that work is being done on this, uh, but um, I, I, it just, I think that that infrastructure is absolutely critical before it actually is practical to deploy. I wanted to uh, jump in really quick and to, to, to kind of paint an image, like if we're going to scale a protocol like Bitcoin, I mean, the OSI model almost looks like a good scale for how to layer things out if we're going to start to go in that direction. But also, if you look at it from the other way down, like the dollar and then all the derivatives and financial instruments and all that stuff, you have Bitcoin at the top of another chain and all the derivatives, which means financial instruments that are possible through doing development on the chain in terms of, okay, back at the beginning, barter was really, really useful. And then using cash and storage of value was a lot more useful than that. And now we have, you know, the option instead of just doing final settlement to find the value propositions of these derivatives that are built out on these uh, other layers instead of trying to bloat that core layer. Would you say that that's a, a, a fair assessment of some of the value proposition that uh, uh, SegWit can bring to Bitcoin? Well, yeah, I think that uh, definitely uh, having this this layered model uh, is very much more in line with like the way that the internet works, right? Um, by having this packet switch network where uh, messages can, messages messages can be routed, um, it no longer is necessary to have these kinds of transmission protocols where people have to tune into particular frequencies and you need to get licenses to do that and all this other kind of stuff, right? Um, this uh, it allows for much more permissionless permissionless innova innovation. People can set up their own uh, uh, their own internet applications, their own uh, web servers or whatever, uh, internet servers uh, to, to host whatever kind of applications. Uh, they don't need to get permission from anyone to do that. They just need to get an IP address assigned and they're good to go, right? Um, so I think that uh, this kind of thing would be great for uh, for, for crypto as well as, you know, as far as having a base layer which um, supports this kind of, uh, you know, trustless, uh, um, you know, settlement. And then on top of it, you can build applications and different protocols can be developed uh, in different ways uh, and and then there we don't get into these kinds of contentious fork issues and stuff like that uh, we, we don't care because uh, you know just like with different kinds of networks they use different protocols um, there's ways to bridge them right I mean as, as long as everyone is able to route packets to each other uh, you can run software on your computer that can translate one protocol to another right or you can uh, use uh, you know tunneling protocols or stuff like that so um, I, I think that uh, having that kind of capability uh, is going to allow for a lot more people to you know creatively uh, creative people to come up with a lot more protocol ideas uh, without having to go through this whole contentious forking nonsense that you know causes all this you know wreaks havoc on everyone this has been uh, a very very erudite and I've, I've, I'm learning a lot and I really love your analogy of the gold and the paper that you started with and I think that I really want to drive that home for everybody that so basically you used to have a custodian that stored the gold and then you would have paper receipts and it actually was an emergent phenomenon. That means that people just started to do it naturally. They started to give out this paper as if it were currency. But back then that paper could be forged and a lot of effort and energy was expended in trying to create unforgeable paper and coins. But when we go to the digital analog, we don't suffer that same problem. We can now use cryptographic proofs as a way of proving that that gold, you know, really is there in the vault. We don't have but to also, trust the bits of paper. But also, the protocol itself is Mr. Goodbank, and Mr. Goodbank was a huge problem too because Mr. Goodbank could be killed, or he could be threatened, or his family could be kidnapped. So we have the cryptographic proofs of what's going on, and now Mr. Goodbank is a, is. Um, immortal like the, like these like when you start to think of the value proposition from this type of an angle it starts to dawn on you that this is big stuff that these are emerging sciences in my opinion absolutely absolutely so we got a couple of questions from the troll box let me just uh, see here Shani what was the first question that we had 
Um, yeah, so with the replay protection, there was some conversation early on. Um, it pretty much would be the same as it was with, with Bcash. Um, you are it is recommended in general, if you are unsure, to set up a separate wallet and to send your uh, original coins over to that wallet in order to avoid the possibility that, you know, by sending it to an exchange, that you accidentally send both the original legacy Bitcoin chain and whatever uh, chain split token is currently um, you know, in vogue right now, whether that's Bcash, or whether that's Segwit2x. So I think there was some confusion when originally Bitcoin Cash was coming out. A lot of people were trying to game the system by sending coins to uh, Bitcoin addresses, uh, Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin addresses on exchanges so that they could sell it sooner. And what they're finding is a lot of exchanges are just turning around saying, look, we're not going to retrieve those coins for you. It just isn't worth our time to import another, you know, HD wallet into our full node and 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 root those coins out for you. So please do not make that mistake again. Yes, the, the somebody already said it's is it safer just not to spend the coins? That is correct. The safest option is for you to control those private keys uh, in your own wallet and to wait for the whole thing to blow over, create a new wallet, and then send your coins over to that wallet in a structured manner. Um, the other question we have isn't really related to what we've been talking about, but uh, somewhat related to what we were talking about yesterday. Um, G. Uh, Willikers asks, can we even get fungibility or privacy without further hard forks? Anyone? I guess Eric, you're probably the most qualified. Can, can we get fungibility yeah. and privacy? Yeah, we, we absolutely can. Uh, there, there are ways to soft fork in new um, crypto. Uh, that's actually one of the uh, another interesting kind of side benefit of uh, of, um, of SegWit that was uh, you know in, in the process of of uh, working on how the SegWit proposal was going to go. Um, we realized that hey, well, you know, this is an opportunity where you can actually add script extensibility. Since we're moving all the script and signature signature data into this other structure, might as well add a version uh, byte to it. So now we can create you know new entire scripts. We can basically uh, uh, you know for, soft fork in any new scripting language that we want at this point. So um, that will allow for adding a whole bunch of new crypto primitives. Uh, which will allow for much uh, more uh, sophistication in that. Uh, however, I do think that there there are certain trade-offs. Um, for instance, uh, you know, ideas like Mimblewimble. Um, very, very interesting idea. Um, uh, however, you have to sacrifice a lot of the uh, scripting uh, capabilities as far as like being able to have more sophisticated uh, smart contracts. Um, it, it, it enables uh, payments, I mean, direct to, to transactions. But if you want to add more conditions to them, then uh, encoding that you know homomorphically into these kinds of cryptographic schemes um, right now uh, seems kind of difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible. It might be possible with some more sophisticated crypto to do this in an efficient manner. Um, but there are trade-offs, um, and, and I think that people need to be aware of that. Uh, but uh, I, I do. I am very hopeful that at least we'll be able to get, um, you know, some better crypto into the uh, into uh, uh, the scripting language that will allow us to be able to do things like Schnorr signatures and signature aggregation. And uh, not only will this uh, allow us uh, for better privacy because it allows us to to combine more more transactions together, but also um, it, it makes it much more efficient as far as the amount of space that's required for these cryptographic proofs. Uh, so um, uh, it's kind of a win-win if we can do it that way. Um, I think that uh, for certain other kinds of uh, approaches, like the whole confidential transactions idea, um, unfortunately, even though that th that is a really great uh, way to uh, create, uh, to have better privacy, it does cr uh, require significantly larger proofs. Uh, so, so that's a trade-off that we have there. And uh, if the anonymity set is not sufficiently large, then it doesn't really have much utility. If it's only a few people that are really using this feature, right, then it's pretty easy to identify who these people are and they're probably doing something bad, right? So uh, uh, this uh, makes it much harder to deploy that in practice, but um, I'm very hopeful. I think there's a lot of breakthroughs uh, happening in cryptography right now uh, that will allow for much better stuff. And I'm just happy that we have a mechanism right now that allows us to actually soft fork it in uh, without requiring a hard fork. I just wanted to say real quick that I hear that Adam Beck is uh, every day he's saying that there's he's making progress on making confidential transactions smaller. So it might happen. And in yeah, the meantime, I, there's uh, there's always fungibility in other ways, you know. Um, but they have their own risks, you know. The 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 larger the tumbler, the more susceptible it is. The better your potential privacy, the, but the more susceptible to being co-opted and then having your transactions uh, exposed over the long term. Great. Any closing thoughts before we leave for today? Anything um, anyone to get to say? To interject really quick.
Mm -hmm. Everybody, there is a new version of Open Dime. You should immediately run out and uh -huh. buy a dozen of them. <laughs> you go to oh, Open Dime's fantastic. Yeah, it, so now you don't you get enough attention. Or something like that. Can you, can you just say what Open Dime is as well, for those who don't know? Yeah, Open Dime is, is pretty much a, um, a hardware device that has a hardware random number generator chip that you feed entropy, usually in the form of like a picture or a small file. And it is actually physically uh, laid out in a way that that private key is inaccessible without physically breaking a circuit path on the chip, which uh, alters how things are accessed in the memory. And it is also cryptographically signed by a manufacturer's key. So that verifying that you can guarantee through the, the publicly posted key through traditional forums and their sites that it is actually a genuine device. So it, it's something that allows you to transact with zero transaction fees physically as many times as you want and gives you a mechanism to actually verify the integrity of the device itself. Anybody who actually deals with Bitcoin person to person in, in any significant way or frequency, I highly recommend you check this out. Is that a paid second. endorsement? Have you been paid or sponsored any considerations you want to reveal? I shill it out of pure love. Exactly. That's what we do on this show. We do we do show products, but only the products we really love, and we don't take any money for them. So, Eric, listen, thanks so much, man. It would be good to have you in the Mumble as well at some point. We've got a little Mumble chat room that, that comes along with the show. And it would be good to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I think this has been really fun, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that we uh, were able to uh, get this out there. I think there's a lot of great uh, stuff that's happening, and it's good for, for uh, um, you know, just to, to keep keep talking about this stuff. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be I'd be more than happy to come in there and chat sometime. Fantastic. All right, thanks everyone at home. Don't forget you can like and subscribe, but only if you want to. Bye bye for now. <laughs>